Good morning and welcome to worship at the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Hendersonville, North Carolina. We are an open and affirming congregation who believe that justice, compassion, and inclusion are all a part of our mission in the world today. I'm the Reverend Carla Miller, and this worship video is filmed for Sunday, January 17th, the second Sunday in Epiphany. I am delighted to welcome you to this service of worship. Let us take a moment now to pray. Holy One, center our hearts center our bodies and center our minds so that we might be with you and one another and hear your love and grace this morning. Amen. Come, let us worship God together. Our scripture reading today is from 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 10. Now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose sight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am, and ran to Eli and said, here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call, lay down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel, 
Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But Eli said, I did not call my child. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if God calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears of it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore, I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or offering forever. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my child. He said, Here I am. Eli said, What was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So, Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from Eli. Then he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel, from Dan to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The contemporary reading today is Why Cling by Rumi. Why cling to one life till it is soiled and ragged? The sun dies and dies, squandering a hundred lives every instant. God has decreed life for you, and God will give another, and another, and another. I grew up going to Sunday school, and it always began with a big assembly of all of the classes. Mrs. Melheim, the pastor's wife, was the Sunday school superintendent and the leader of these assemblies in which we did a lot of singing of hymns. One of my favorites was, I love to tell the story. Do you know it? I love to tell the story of unseen things above, of Jesus and his glory and of Jesus and his love. I love to tell the story because I know tis true. It satisfies my longings as nothing else will do. I love to tell the story. T'will be my theme in glory to tell the old, old story of Jesus and his love. As an avid reader, 
as a child and now, I loved the thought that this whole church thing, the whole Bible thing, the whole religion thing, the whole Sunday school thing was about story. I loved stories and I loved reading them and reading them indeed satisfied some of the deepest longings of my mind, my heart, like nothing else. So the story of Jesus' love made sense to me. Stories. The power of story and storytelling is a unique human trait, as old as speech and diverse as culture. We tell stories to narrate our experiences and make sense of our lives. We learn from story. We are transformed by story. And research shows that stories, whether they are told by movies or books, poetry, and real life, affect the way we think and act. In short, our brains can be changed by story. And then there's the internal stories that we tell ourselves, and they can affect our well-being. Narratives of, I'm not good enough, or people have hurt me all of my life, so that is the truth that will never change. While maybe they were true at one time, maybe received in childhood, they can continue to wreak damage on a person's well-being and their emotions and mental health. Therapy helps people process these stories and discover new stories that can lead to a more full and satisfying life. New stories are important because the world and our lives are ever changing. And this is true in the narrative we heard from the Old Testament this morning. It's a classic Sunday school story, the one about Eli and Samuel. It's also a classic call story where someone hears a message from God and answers, here am I. It also is an unusual narrative of someone who is able to embrace a new story. The text begins. The word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. In other words, Israel is lost. They have no sense of where God is. And then we find ourselves in the presence of Eli, the high priest. Now you may remember Eli as the priest who accused Hannah of drunkenness when she went to pray for her son. Her protest moved him, and he wished her well. Hannah's eventual child, Samuel, was being raised by Eli in the tabernacle. Eli, for all intents and purposes, was the leader of the people at Shiloh at that time. However, there is no record of him ever, ever hearing from God. And in addition, his sons were the assistant priests. And unfortunately, they were corrupt. They were cruel and abusive. They stole the best parts of the sacrifices meant for God. They raped the women who were serving at the tent of meeting. And their abuses continued beyond that. It appears in the biblical record that Eli did little, if anything, to control his sons and protect the people. So here we are in the middle of the night, Samuel and Eli. Three times Samuel is awakened by a voice calling to him. He thinks it is old Eli needing his assistance. However, by the last time, Eli realizes that it is God awakening Samuel and instructs Samuel on how to be still and answer God if he hears the voice again. And of course, Samuel does hear the voice again and is given kind of a troubling message about the destruction of the house of Eli and Samuel is reluctant the next day to relate this story to Eli, and yet 
Eli insists, in spite of probably knowing at this point the message isn't going to be a good news message for him personally or for his family. Indeed, the message was that they would be removed from service because of their abuses. Now, while this narrative is primarily focused on the beautiful readiness of Samuel to listen to God's voice and courageously share God's message as prophecy, I find the character of Eli compelling in spite of so many people portraying him as the worst leader ever to date in the Bible. Yes, he is a jerk to Hannah, who is praying so loudly and passionately, but he also, and accusing her of being drunk, but he shows that he can be open to another reality besides his own. After listening to Hannah, after considering her story, he is able to change his mind. And instead of accusation, he offers hope for wholeness for her. He embraces a new story instead of hanging on to his old script with his own biases and perceptions. Our text today also portrays Eli with a dimmed sense of sight. And the Hebrew words make clear that this is an intentional double meaning here. The Bible isn't just saying that Eli can't see very well, but that his mental and emotional and spiritual insight are blurred. But he's not so lost that he can't perceive that something is happening with Samuel. And he is not so lost that he cannot advise Samuel on how to best hear the voice of God in these moments. And he is not so lost that he cannot accept the message of judgment upon his family. Here am I, Samuel says to God. Hinene, here I am, ready to serve, to do as you ask. Abraham, Mary, Joseph, and among others in the Bible, respond to God with these same words. Hinene, they are being called to journeys of servanthood that will be filled with challenge, difficulties, leadership, and strength. Eli's response to Samuel's Henene is a giving over of acceptance that will take him on a different journey. We don't know the ending except for that he has to give up the control he thought he had, which in fact really he didn't. His witness today to us is his ability to surrender and embrace a new story, one where he is not the center of it. This week, Richard Rohr's daily meditations have centered around the power of story and faith. He writes, it doesn't matter how old we are, we all need stories to believe in. If there's no storyline, no integrating images that define who we are or that give our lives meaning or direction, we just won't be happy. I can't imagine I'm alone in longing for us collectively to embrace a better story, one that has the power to change our hearts and minds and enliven our imagination. Friends, we are on the precipice of a new story. With the advent of the vaccination, there is a light at the end of this pandemic tunnel. That doesn't mean, however, that things are going to get back to normal. No, think about it. The pandemic has changed so many things. For instance, more people shop online and many will never return to malls or grocery stores. 
More people have learned about streaming movies, and this has changed the movie industry. More people have bought at-home gyms and equipment and may never renew their gym memberships. And many office buildings will remain vacant as companies realize that people working from home is a good thing and a good use of their resources. These trends have also infiltrated religious communities. Many people actually enjoy worshiping at home in their pajamas and coffee. And other people have discovered the ability to participate in church activities like Bible studies and book studies online, where perhaps before they couldn't. This is a new story for the church, and we will need to consider it. We won't go back to Egypt, but there is a promised land we will discover. I also know that outside of the pandemic, our congregation is moving into a new story where we will be challenged to consider other perceptions, embrace forgiveness, and move into deepened relationship with one another and what it means to be a community of love, compassion, and justice in the wake of a conflict and into new waters of reconciliation. Many of you are being called personally to a new story of being and living in the midst of all this change. It's been a year, hasn't it? And this is an uncomfortable place to be. Storyteller Clarissa Pinkola Estes says, Stories set the inner life into motion, and this is particularly important when the inner life is frightened, wedged, or cornered. Story greases the hoists and pulleys. It causes adrenaline to surge, shows us the way out, down, or up, and for our trouble, cuts for us the line with where doors were previously blank walls, openings that lead to us to dreamland, that lead us to love and learning, that lead us into our own real lives, our own new storied lives. I imagine that we are all being called in the same way like Samuel to lead in the telling of a new story in discovering what is healing, healthy, and best for our world, our church, our lives. Do we dare respond to the depth of Hinene? I am here. I am ready. And I have no doubt that we all are also being challenged, like Eli, to let go of our own tightly held perceptions of reality. We are being called to be open to being changed by another viewpoint and ultimately in certain circumstances to let go of the old stories that just aren't working anymore. We are being called to surrender to a new story. May we share in this work and ministry of story sharing and storytelling together. Amen.
We come now to a time of prayer. As a community, we lift up all those who are sick, for healthcare workers of all kinds, for those who are grieving. We lift up our country in this difficult time and pray that a spirit of empathy, forgiveness, and unity might begin to connect us. And for our church, we pray, and for each and every person who is a part of our family in this place. And now in the silence, may we each lift up our concerns for ourselves and for others and for our world. Loving God, hear our prayer. And may we know in this moment, in spite of everything that is happening, that all shall be well. And so let us all join together in telling a new story, a story of hope and transformation that can only live into God's grace for this world. And as you go telling your story, may you be blessed and know that you are loved as if there were but one of you to love. Amen.